over 2,600 fans entered the Memorial Coliseum on Monday night to see the IPFW men's basketball team take on Oakland University of the Mid-Continent Conference. To see how things turned out, stay tuned to Mastodon Spotlight. It's coming up next. Hi again, everybody. I'm Mike Miles. Welcome to another edition of Mastodon Spotlight. Well, as I said a moment ago, over 2,600 fans came into the Memorial Coliseum on Monday night. They wanted to see how the IPFW basketball team would do against Oakland University of the Mid-Continent Conference. With us, the head coach of IPFW men's basketball, Doug Nolan. Doug, Monday night was fun as far as the men's team was concerned. Uh, I know we can say that now after the fact because when the final horn went off, it was IPFW 77, Oakland University 71, but second time around in the Coliseum, uh, let's talk a little bit about the ball game. Well, from the first time, uh, we, we're a little, we have a little different look as far as the team goes. There's probably three kids we don't have right now that <clears throat> we had at that point in time, but we were just coming in uh, and especially coming off a, uh, what I would say, a, a, a game that we really didn't play well and our effort level wasn't where we wanted it to be. And so uh, we worked the entire week on, on uh, our toughness factor uh, areas that we needed to improve. And then, of course, uh, we had some time to work on uh, Oakland's uh, amoeba defense, which uh, uh, Joe and, and Fred uh, really did a great job with. And, and Joe put a great scouting report together. We got probably four days of prep time with that while they were playing on Thursday, Saturday, uh, leading up to the game. So it was, it was good for us, and, and we were really hoping that we could respond last night in front of a big crowd, and, and it, worked our, it worked to our advantage, and, and it's a great feeling, I can tell you. <laughs> well, we're going to look at some highlights, and uh, John Yaus, when you're ready, you can go ahead and start. But uh, f first half action here, IPFW in the white. And uh, I'll just let you comment, Doug, anytime you see fit. Well, basically with the Amoeba defense, uh, there's spots that we need to, uh, we need to uh, occupy and control so uh, you know, we, can, we can look to other spots uh, for good shots. And we, di we did that uh, in that previous play. We flashed to the middle, which is a, a great uh, push point for us to, uh, to look to wings or short corners and Kess turn around and <clears throat> knocked a shot down that, um, I thought was you know uh, early in the game, but it really established some things for Jim and and uh, you know I thought he played very well last night, led us in rebounding, uh, knocked down some points for us. Again, you know Terry Collins had 25, Jeremy King 14, but uh, Keon Henderson really stepped up with nine points, had some big putbacks, key rebounds. We had two players with eight, so uh, it was really a good team effort. Everybody scored and. Uh, you know, that was a great thing with us here. Terry gets just an offensive rebound. Again, off a zone, they don't have uh, particular people they need to put bodies on, and so sometimes uh, you get the opportunity to get, grab a rebound or two, and Terry didn't hesitate. He just went right back up and knocked the shot down. Oakland's got a little bit of size. They got a seven-footer, and uh, see a foul called away from the ball. And that seven-footer out of uh, Canada, Five or six on the floor in the first half, and yet only one field goal in the second half. I know I asked you this in the post-game conference last night. Uh, what did you do different in the second half to keep him? Because you would have thought that they would have hammered it inside to him. Yeah, you know, we were, we were under a mismatch early in the game because uh, we started 
Really, uh, just one one post player and Jim is Jim Kesnick is probably more of a perimeter player even than he is a post player and he's more comfortable outside. But uh, Nick Wise had to guard uh, Dan Champagne six seven about two thirty two forty and and uh, we just tried to front uh, with uh, their big kid. Uh, we really tried to side front, really tried to uh, uh, not allow him to catch down on the block, try to have him catch uh, a little above the block because I don't really think he's very effective when he gets out to 8, 10 feet. And that's what we tried to do uh, at halftime. We made some adjustments, and, and Helms had a big first half as well, and he only scored a basket or two in the second half. Uh, the same with uh, Sabra. And so uh, I thought our adjustments at halftime defensively were really – uh, really right on, and, and I think our adjustments offensively were even much better. I mean, we shot 68% from the field in the second half. Uh, we took 18 threes the first half. We took four the second half. We were much more under control offensively. We didn't, we didn't just, uh, you know, make one pass and, and try to shoot a quick shot. We were more patient. We looked to spots. We even uh, used mo m most of the 35-second shot clock a lot in the second half, and, and we don't do that a lot. I mean, we're, we're a team that uh, likes to get up and down and, and shoot the shot fairly quickly, but I thought we did a good job of being a little more patient and, you know, just letting the offense come to us. We look here, the perimeter passing between D and Terry. Nice little shot there by TC. At one point, Terry scored 10 consecutive points early on. Is it your philosophy if someone's got the hot hand to go to him, or is it just the way it turned out that... He was open and felt comfortable and knocked it down. Well, I think both. Uh, I think he was open, knocked it, you know, knocked a few shots down. He got his confidence. But that's one thing guys on the floor have to realize, whether it's Nick, uh, J.K., uh, Terry, uh, or anybody, you know, if, if, they, if they hit a shot or two, you know, you need to try to look for them and go back to them if you can. Now, obviously, def defenses are going to step up a little bit and maybe try to take away some things. But uh, with, with, you know, our situation... Terry really got on a roll. He missed his first three of the game, but then knocked a couple more down. That really gave him a lot of confidence, and uh, he, he, just, he was just big for us. He stepped up. He played well at the Coliseum the first time around. Um, you know, he talked to me, and I talked to him about just be patient. Uh, you know, the Oakland game's going to get here before you know it, but uh, he was really hurting that first game when he couldn't play, and he had to sit, and, and um, you know, it was frustrating. People don't sometimes understand that, but um, you know, he's a player, and, and, and I think he's going to continue to get better. He's a freshman. People have to understand that. He's going to be inconsistent. But right now, consistency is what's really uh, uh, what he's doing well for us. And, you know, he had 20 against uh, Illinois Chicago. Um, I haven't even looked, but he probably is averaging 13 maybe points a game somewhere in that area. And, and uh, that's just been a big plus for us. And, he can play both. I think he's a little more comfortable at the shooting guard, but he can play uh, both one and two, and that gives uh, a nice advantage. Just saw him knock another jumper down here as we're now in the second half. You mentioned uh, a little bit, too, other players that stepped up, and especially in light of the fact that Nick Wise, who's averaging 19 points a game, subpar night for him. He only had eight, but uh, it was nice to see, as you see, Kess poured on a rebound, and here we are on the run. Well, this is a great three-point play by Keon. I mean, uh, he took the hit. He finished the play. You know, a year ago, that wouldn't have happened. And he's just made great strides uh, even this year. And we've tried to get him to, you know, go strong to the basket, use his athleticism, but at the same time, you know, take the contact. And that's what he just did. He, he took it to the defensive guy. He knew there was going to be contact, and he didn't shy away. He took the hit. He stayed with it. He got the ball up on the rim. Uh, most of this year, that ball would have fallen out. Uh, last night, it was, uh, it was great. Uh, we got some rolls. We got a little bit of luck. And, and uh, you know, as I look at it, our kids, you could see it in their eyes. You could see it in their step. Uh, even when we were up 10 and they made their run to tie it up and even take a one-point lead, uh, we, didn't, we didn't really, uh, I think, have a, uh, have a look of fear or panic. I think we really just said, hey, we're just going to stay, we're going to believe, we're going to keep playing hard, and uh, let's just stay with it. We got some uh, great steals in the second half down the stretch as Keon made that uh, shot. Uh, we rebounded the basketball pretty well, and, and uh, you know, we just, we, we, we played the full 40 minutes, and we haven't done that this year. This is uh, 
Terry, at this point, it's seven, uh, 69 all. It is late, just over two minutes left. And uh, we're working, we're patient on the offense. And Terry is about to knock down the three pointer, which in essence is the, uh, is the winning shot because it put us up 72 69, just under two minutes left. They ended up with 71, we ended up with 77. But uh, all in all, uh, a very nice performance by your ball club. Well, that was a big shot by Terry. I mean, you know, he had, uh, he had the hot hand the first half with 17. Didn't get as many looks the second half. They made some nice adjustments, but he was patient. And, you know, as the shot clock was winding down, I thought uh, D'Angelo really did a nice job of controlling the, the, the tempo, getting the floor spaced. He didn't panic. Uh, Jim Kesnick had the ball uh, late in that possession, kicked it back out to D. D swung it to Terry. Uh, he just stepped up with a with a dribble and knocked a shot down and and uh, you know I I just can't say enough about you know how he came to play last night at the Coliseum and and uh, how most of our guys played and it is nice to see uh, and I don't wish this on Nick but it's nice to see that when Nick uh, maybe doesn't have a great game or has a subpar game other guys can elevate their game and and uh, you know we were playing without Bubakar last night. Uh, down to 10 kids, but I thought everybody gave us something uh, during the game uh, from a, a different aspect of uh, what we needed last night, and, and, it, and it paid off. And, uh, you know, we've had enough tough luck this year that it was great that uh, the guys, uh, you know, got to experience uh, a win at the Coliseum in front of a big crowd. Before we go to break in this segment, I just want to take it one step further to what you just said. Everybody contributed, and I think of situations Brad, for example, he only scored one point, but that one point was a big free throw because it made it a two-possession ball game at 75-71. Um, Kess played well. Zach Ruder coming in because there was foul trouble, you know, and Nick fouled out early. And at one point, Nick, um, Jeremy King, and Jim Kessnick all had four fouls in the second half. But if you can briefly talk about the contributions or how great it seemed to have everybody who hit the floor last night in white contribute to the victory. Well, no doubt, Mike, and uh, I'm not going to get started on the officials and all the fouls <laughs> that we had. But um, really, uh, Lee Batts came in and played really solid in the first half. I thought he did a nice job controlling the, uh, uh, the tempo for us. Uh, he's a threat uh, to shoot. Um, you know, Brad stepped up, and, and uh, we have confidence in him. I mean, he didn't play well last night. Uh, but when it came down to crunch time, we wanted him in the game in case of uh, getting fouled. He did miss the first free throw, but he only had like nine minutes in the game. So, you know, he set for quite a while, but he still came back and focused enough after the, the first miss that he hit the second shot. Uh, you know, Matt Shepard gave us uh, a couple good minutes, uh, knocked a shot off the glass uh, in the second half. And it's, it's got to take everybody. And, uh, you know, when one or two players aren't going aren't gonna to play, uh, or aren't playing up to their capabilities or having off nights, you know, other kids have to step up. And that's really, um, that, that, that's great for them because then their playing time uh, increases a lot. They can contribute to the team and then help themselves for more minutes down, down the road. But all in all, I, I mean, it was a great team victory. Uh, I can't say enough, as I said, about my assistants and in the preparation that uh, they did for this game. And, and granted, we had a you know, we had it a little easier than Oakland, as I mentioned. They played Thursday, Saturday. We haven't played for nine days, so we got to spend more time against them. Now we're, we're the shoes on the other foot. We got one day of preparation for our next three games, but uh, I feel all winnable, uh, all at home, and, and uh, we're going to get ready to go with those. Final score, IPFW 77, Oakland University 71. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to speak with Terry Collins, who had the 25 points in the victory. But that's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. With over 30 years of dedication to his students, Professor of Geosciences Deepak Chowdhury recognizes the IPFW experience. He doesn't spoon feed you all the information that you need. He mostly will give you all of the knowledge that you need in bits and pieces. And it's almost like a puzzle where he gives you all the pieces and in the end, you'll put it together and have the larger picture yourself. I really enjoy it. He's a great professor to work with and for. IPFW is one of only three universities in the state to offer students hands-on experience with their own seismograph. This gives Dr. Chowdhury great pride 
but it is the interaction with his students that has kept him teaching. When the students understand the concept, what's happening, that glimmer of light in their eyes, that's that you cannot trade for any money. So that's the most important thing. IPFW, the right school, right here, right now. I'm Richard Dean Anderson. On Stargate SG-1, we discovered that the Stargate device could be used to explore an endless variety of adventures. Your device for endless adventure is a good education. No matter what your goals might be, you'll go a lot farther if you don't drop out. So keep your options open. Stay in school. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. Time now for one of my favorite portions of our show, the chance to interview a student athlete here at IPFW. And this week, one of the stars of Monday night's victory for the men's basketball team over Oakland University. We welcome to the program Terry Collins. Welcome to Mastodon Spotlight. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself, if you could. Um, I'm a sophomore, a uh, freshman on the basketball court. Um, this is my second year at IPFW. Last year I've, I set out because of uh, some transfer rules, Division I transfer rules. Um, I had to set out at the beginning of this year also. Um, I'm originally from Fort Wayne. I attended uh, Snyder High School. Um, I originally went to college in North Carolina before coming here at Appalachian State. But uh, hey, fate brought me back to IPFW and Fort Wayne. You played at Snyder High School, member of the Summit Athletic Conference. What was it like playing against Bishop Twanger and Northside and Concordia and, and some of the other schools in the SAC? Um, I enjoyed it a lot playing against people that you'd see when you went to the mall or out around town because it wasn't like, you know, we really didn't like each other. Everybody was pretty much friendly. You know, you went on the court and you played and after that, friends and stuff. Uh, it was a tough conference. I don't think we got a lot of pub as much as like Indianapolis or other conferences, but we did produce a, the SEC produced a lot of good players that uh, attended some big colleges, but it's a lot of good competition in SAC. You had the chance, and, and we discussed it briefly before we started filming the segment, you played for two different coaches in high school, um, Steve Riley and, and Ray Sims. Talk about the difficulties, if there are, in having to play to two different systems? Well, my freshman year, um, S Steve Riley was my coach, and he um, he wanted me to play varsity, but he was a little worried about what the seniors and juniors would think because he wanted me to pretty much take the team over as a freshman, and I didn't feel comfortable myself doing it. I always worry about what other people think also. So he uh, put me on a freshman team, uh, pretty much dominated for other freshmen, so they moved me up, moved me up to reserve. I played one game and I think I had like 35 points and they took me off of that and they put me on varsity. And the first couple of games I was just working my way in. Then in the, about after three games he just told me, hey, you get the ball, take it to the hole, shoot it, whatever. And his system was kind of like Coach Sims except for Coach Sims was more, it wasn't just me, it was also I had a teammate, Demetri Gamble, who was also a, a good scorer. But other than that, Coach Sims was, hey, you are Demetri Giddy, you go ahead and create and then everybody else just follows your lead. What do you like to do more, shoot the outside jumper or utilize your quickness and make the steal and go in for the layup? I haven't really had a lot of chances so far in college to get the steal or utilize my quickness a lot, basically because defenses are so much quicker and I'm, they pretty much just back in and step up in the middle and it's hard for me to create my own shot. So what I'm trying to do is just open up the outside a little bit so they have to get up close to me and then I can maybe get around them. We talked a little bit in the post-game press conference last night. I asked the question, I'm going to ask it again. You mentioned that you had to sit out due to the fact that you had to transfer from Appalachian State back here to IPFW. This is the first year where we're playing a primarily Division I schedule. How difficult has it was it for you not to be able to lace up the shoes the first semester and the first half of this season? I don't think a lot of people really understand unless you just have a love for something. 
and you know I really love basketball. It's really the only sport I, I really ever really truly wanted to play throughout my whole life. Uh, it was the first game was at the Coliseum it was the most difficult thing in the world. We when we went to that practice at the Coliseum the day before the game and the day of the game, I just sat on the sideline. I didn't want to shoot. I didn't want to get on the court. I told him I don't want to practice because I said I just can't handle it. It was it was really really tough, and not saying that I was going to cry, but next to that, whatever it is, that's how I felt. And Coach Noel, you know, he just told me to be patient because you would have your chance against Oakland to play in the Coliseum. And he's like, don't worry, and everything will turn out okay. I would say it did turn out okay because uh, on Monday night we look at the box score, 25 points a game and, and so far career high. 17 of those came in the first half. Uh, you also had uh, five rebounds, two assists, and a steal. And uh, not bad uh, for playing in front of over 2,600 fans and playing against a team that won uh, the Mid-Continent regular season title last year. Uh, talk about a little bit about last night's or uh, Monday night's game. Uh, when the game started during warm-ups, I felt pretty good. And I can usually tell if I'm going to have a good game or not by the way I warm up. And it just felt good during warm-ups. And, you know, once the game started, I think they left me open for a minute. I hit, like, maybe two quick shots, hit another deep three, and after that, everything just fell into place, and we played a full 40 minutes as a team, and we finally we came out with a big win. In the first half, at one point, you scored 10 straight points for the Mastodons, and as you say, the confidence level must have been up, and you felt comfortable. At halftime, you had 17 points, and I know I asked you this last night, I'll ask it again uh, for our viewers. Were you concerned that maybe in the second half, Oakland, they already play a unique defense as it is, what they call the amoeba defense. Were you concerned that maybe they may try to do something even totally different to shut you down and keep you out of your game? Well, during the first half, I heard their coach telling players, you know, don't worry about the man on the baseline. Step up on Collins. He's the one that's hurting us right now. In the second half, I really didn't think they'd change up their defense because of all the films we've seen, they had never changed it up out of the amoeba. But I did expect it for them to play a little bit higher to, so when I catch the ball, you know, I wouldn't be, have a chance to look at the rim. So what I told my teammates is, hey, if they step up on me, come to the basketball, I'm going to get it to you because they're going to be expecting me to shoot it. That will give you chances to get open and make some shots. 25 points against Oakland. The game prior to that against Illinois Chicago, you had 20 points. You also had 20 points against Long Beach State when you were able to finally play and go out west. You're becoming a marked man, I think, for the opposition. Uh, how do you feel now about your ball club? We still have some games left. We've got three games coming up in the next week here at home. Um, the taste of victory, I know, is sweet. Uh, how do you foresee the future in the rest of this season? Hopefully, we can uh, finish the season out strong. Uh, I hope we can play well. I hope last night you know, continues on with our team, playing tough for a full 40 minutes and playing together. Uh, I'm hoping we can win out these next, what, three or four games at home and then take it on the road and, hey, you never know, we can finish out the whole season, the rest of the season without a loss, and I hope that's what we accomplish. Let's turn away from the basketball court for a moment. What's your field of study here at the university? Um, criminal justice. Uh-oh. <laughs> Want to be a poli policeman or a uh, state some, policeman somewhere. or a prison guard or? Probation officer. Probation maybe. officer. Yeah. What is it like to play for Coach Doug Noll? Um, coach Noll is a, is a great person, not only as a coach, but the reason I decided to come back to IPFW is because during my, uh, he came to my home for a visit and he and Coach P were so down to earth, you know, they weren't trying to say, hey, you come here, you'll get this, you'll get this. They were just talking to me one-on-one, -on -one, like, you know, a friend you've had for a number of years or something. and. When I, when I decided to transfer, I didn't want to look at any other schools. I just thought about it. I was like, hey, Coach No, when he came to visit, he told me, you know, he talked to me. I, I heard what I wanted to hear, and I just said, hey, I'm going to give him a call and see if I can maybe come there. And he said, yeah, we'd, like to, we'd love to have you. He just got me. As we look ahead, uh, this year, as you say, we've got some games at home this coming week. Then you go back and hit the road. You're going to finish the bulk of the season on the road. But you're going to play against some teams that we may possibly, and I'll phrase it that way, 
face in the future on a regular basis if we're fortunate to get into a conference. Teams like IUPUI, mm -hmm. uh, Missouri, Kansas City, uh, that from the Midcon, if we go to the Midcon or, or who knows what conference we're in. But uh, talk about briefly, as we only have a couple of minutes left, the camaraderie of this year's team. Uh, especially, it's been a tough year. Yeah. You know, we, we lost one player due to academics. We started out, our two, two of our big guys had foot fractures. Never could really gel. You couldn't play in the first half. What was it like during the first part of the season, especially, and you talked a little bit about yourself, but talk from a team aspect, not being able to all play together, and then now in the second half of the season, now most of you are able to play. Uh, what's it been like for the team? I think in the first half, you know, due to some injuries and some problems that we had, I think the team, we had, you know, so many different lineups and so many different people going in and out. I don't think we had a chance to jail in the first half. And then in the second half, we still haven't had because I'm coming in and some people are coming back off of injuries. And, you know, you're trying to find out where you belong in this team and what your role is. And some people right now, we're just, well, right now we're just finding out what our roles are. And hopefully, I hope it's at the right time. And, you know, we can finish out the season and go ahead lead it into next year on a strong note. Well, we appreciate you giving us a little bit of time. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on uh, the big win on Monday night. And uh, we wish you success the rest of the way, uh, not only this season, but three more seasons after that. Yes, hope so. Terry Collins has been our guest, uh, member of the IPFW men's basketball team. We will take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk with the assistant coaches on the team, Joe Pachota and Fred Andrews, and we're going to talk about strategy, something that was very important in Monday night's ballgame. But that's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. If we do not take responsibility for saving animals from extinction, we allow a part of ourselves to die with them. Help World Wildlife Fund protect animals and the places where they live by ordering a free action kit. Together, we can leave our children a living planet. Come in, she said, I'll give you shelter from the star. Today's teenagers, the way people talk, you'd think they can't do anything right. It's just not so. We get to know over 300,000 kids a year, smart kids, who know what they want. They believe in themselves, and they believe in America. Some go straight to college. Others choose to learn leadership, discipline, courage, and commitment first with us. Today's military, making a stronger America, one good kid at a time. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. Earlier in the program, Coach Noel alluded to the fact that he had a lot of help from his assistants, and uh, we decided, since we've had him on the show before and enjoyed having him, we asked him to come back again and talk about the preparation for this victory that IPFW achieved over, or, or over rather, Oakland University. So we welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. To my right, Joe Pachota, and to Joe's right, Fred Andrews. And gentlemen, first and foremost, talk about last night the thoughts, the plans, and uh, just the emotional feel of coming off the floor with a victory over a quality Division One opponent. Well, Mike, I think the main thing that we wanted to do is we didn't want a repeat performance of what had happened uh, the previous Saturday against Illinois Chicago. Um, you know, like Coach alluded to, uh, that was not very good basketball, and that's not Mastodon basketball. So we wanted to get back to basics, and, and we were fortunate because we had a significant number of days to prepare for Oakland and what they did. So. We came back, uh, gave him Sunday off, turned around and had two practices on Monday uh, to kind of set the tone, uh, if you will, to be polite uh, as far as us getting back to basics and how we wanted to play uh, Mastodon basketball and, and what we need to do to be successful. And Those days of practice weren't very easy uh, and they weren't meant to be easy. 
because like coaches touched on numerous times, uh, we, we've got to be tough and we've got to play tough. And, and we, we got that ball rolling real early on Monday morning and, it, and we reaped the fruits of, uh, of our labors uh, last night. And it, I, I was real pleased, as was Freddie, I know, and coach as well with, with how the guys performed uh, last night. For the benefit of some of our viewers that really don't understand uh, the job description for an assistant basketball coach, take us back if you can. Uh, you alluded to the fact that on a week ago Saturday, UIC kicked our butts, which they did. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. No pun intended. When did you start preparation for the Oakland game? And, and walk us through exactly what some of those steps were. How you go about, be it the scouting, the tapes, the who, and, and uh, Doug mentioned that you alternate uh, in terms of who sets up the game plan, but talk about the formation of the game plan. Uh, I mean, that I think that really started probably on that Sunday after UIC or maybe even Monday as far as getting the basics. Uh, with the film exchange that we have, we had four or five tapes of them, of games that they had played throughout the year already in our possession. So you take one game at a time, you pick up tendencies as far as individuals and what they do and their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and then you go over concepts and philosophies offensively and defensively. And it's basically just like a big puzzle and then you put it together. But Oakland was a little different because offensively, I mean, they're, they're a pretty good offensive team. But the defense is the one thing that we were concerned with because they do run something that not a lot of people in the country do. And it's very difficult to prepare for. And like I said, we were fortunate because we had you know, a significant amount of time to prepare for it. I feel bad for teams that don't have a lot of time because it's, it's tough. And, uh, I think as, as a group, as a staff, we did a pretty good job of, of coming up with a game plan that we felt was going to be conducive for our kids to be successful. Uh, and we put it together, the guys picked up on it real well, and um, we were able to execute it. The definition of the amoeba defense? Changes shapes, where no matter where the ball is or how people are aligned, it changes shapes. It's not like a, a strict 2-3, it's not a strict 1-3-1, one, one. It kinda, it's kind of like a matchup really. It really is, and you know that's you know I was kind of fortunate. I've been able to coach under a guy who ran it, so I kind of know the background of what they do. But now, again, each team does it a little bit different. You know, each coach, you know, maybe like Oakland, they'll they'll extend and trap a little bit more. Some people like to settle back a little bit more, right around the 20, 25 feet area. So again, that's kind of what the Meva B defense is. If you can answer this, do you think that the goal of the Amoeba defense, obviously you'd like to create turnovers, but is it designed more for a player to, to steal a pass or to cause the opposition to throw the pass away? I think it might be a little of both. I mean, mm -hmm. it all depends, like Freddie touched on, what face it has and it's taking shape. Uh, one thing that we knew that Oakland was going to do coming in was they do a great job of pressuring passing lanes. Uh, in all the tapes that we had, the one thing that we emphasized, and teams that, that were was successful against it was uh, Michigan State was very successful, Wright State was very successful. The one team that struggled with it was Toledo, and against a zone like that, the one thing that you cannot do is look to penetrate it off the dribble. And that's one thing that they did, and they struggled with it. Uh, and Michigan State looked to attack it with the pass, and getting in the gaps and skip passes, same thing with Wright State. Uh, and talking with a few of their coaches, they felt that we had better perimeter shooters than their own respected teams. So that made me feel pretty good when it came time to say, okay, here's what we can do, here's what we can't do, here's what we have, here's what we do not have. So, you know, like I said, when we laid everything out on the table and said, okay, let's, we're going to attack it this way, we've got this, we've got this, I think this can work, let's put it in and let's roll with it and see what happens, and, and, it, and it worked out well. We talk about the passing lanes, and, and I think back to the ball game. It almost seemed, and correct me if I'm wrong, in some ways you take, kind of attacked it with what I call a 1 2 2 offense. Because you had either Terry or D, uh, or when Brad was in, at the point up top, and then you had your off guards or your small forwards on the wings, and then you had your bigger players down in the, in the blocks. Um, Talk about how you go about, uh, you know, obviously if they want to, you know, control the passing lanes and the gaps, how, how exactly do you try to attack it? You, you mentioned a skip pass, but is it designed almost like a, to get a high post and then a 
run it around and, and hope for a backdoor play, or, or is it more or less eventually find somebody open for an 18-footer? I think the way that we attacked it was was the right angle as far mm -hmm. as we wanted to attack it from the baseline up mm -hmm. from the short corner. So we put we start off putting Jim Kessnich down there and Jeremy King. So now you've got a bigger, more athletic player who can see over the top of the zone and an athlete that's looking to flash towards the middle. Mm -hmm. And then you've got shooters like Terry Collins and Nick Wise on the perimeter who are great catch and shoot guys. So no matter, you know, like Freddie touched on, whatever face it might show, one time they would pack it in a little bit. Other times, uh, their point man, Jason Rizicki, was picking up on the other side of the timeline. Mm -hmm. So now that's going to be more conducive. We're going to have so much more area to attack that middle. We want to attack it from the baseline up and attack that middle. And more importantly, make the big kid make a decision and make non-athletes play against the athletes. And I think that's one thing that caused them a lot of problems and probably why the big kid really didn't play a lot in the second half. I thought we were the aggressors. Uh, we shot extremely high percentage in the second half because uh, we got the shots that we wanted. Well, the bottom line was a nice six-point victory, and, and Coach has given you some, uh, I feel honestly, and I'm selfish on this, well-deserved praise because uh, it's a shame that the public does not understand, truthfully, the job that the assistant coaches do to help the boss. But since Doug said he's going to give you an extra paycheck somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's, let's move ahead now. It's a tough schedule coming up in the sense that we've got three games in roughly six days with only one day of preparation for each ball game. Um, talk about these upcoming three games and what the preparation hopefully will be like and, and what do you try and what can you accomplish in such a short period of time? Well, uh, again, I think what you've got to do is you've got to be organized. You've got to you have great time management. Uh, you know, luckily we're already pretty much done with the Middle Tennessee State Scout, so you know that's already taken care of. Now we can, you know, as you know, as a as a coach, while everybody else gets ready for East Tennessee State, you know, I can maybe look ahead at Lipscomb a little bit. So you're almost taking one game ahead every time. So once that game's done, you know, you're already prepared for the next team, and then you can prepare for the next team after that. Uh, you know, I think both teams, are, both games, like I said. Uh, you know, probably all three are very winnable games. Uh, do we have to play well? Yes. We have to come out and play with a great effort, but, you know, each team has some deficiencies that we can take advantage of. And, you know, I think that's something that's very important. You know, we've got to kind of use that, use the Oakland game as a springboard and, and come out with the same type of intensity, same type of energy to kind of help get over the top of these next three or four games. In the preparation of a team for an upcoming opponent, how much emphasis is on attacking the opponent's weakness and how much emphasis is there on going with your team's strengths? I, I think you always have to go to your own team's strengths. Uh, you, but what you've got to do is you've got to look at, you know, can you exploit, does your team's strengths allow you to exploit the other team's weaknesses? And, you know, sometimes you know, maybe their weaknesses we really can't exploit as much, so we've got to find another way around it, or maybe we can't exploit it, you know, all the time. So what we've got to do is, again, we've got to think about ourselves. We've think, got to think about IPFW, and then what we've got to do is kind of use that, look at our strengths and weaknesses, and see how we can best prepare to play them or how, how, to, how to play them, you know, to get a win. Two more questions before we're out of time. One question, Joe, Monday night, and, and this is more or less for you and me, our benefits, because we both attended Concordia Ann Arbor. Um, thoughts about that game from a personal standpoint, because we went there. Uh, I look forward to hammering on him. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I've known Chip, you know, for a long time, as has Coach Noel, uh, and like he has touched on, it's a, ch it's a chance to... Um, you know, help out their program financially because with both of us having NAIA backgrounds, uh, we know what it's like, you know, to not play with any money. <laughs> uh, so that money definitely helps them. It'll help us tune up as far as giving us an opportunity to play well, uh, which we will. Um, and, you know, a chance to see Chip and get him down here and, and beat on him a little <laughs> bit. That way the loser can, can buy dinner at the Final Four or something like that. Final question. A team walked off the court last night on an emotional high. Nice crowd, mm -hmm. big win. They hung in there, um, as Terry said, for 40 minutes. 
now you got to break them down. How difficult will it be in, in one sense to break this team down and keep them from being too high and hopefully they won't be so low that they'll come out flat Thursday night? Well, I, I think we started doing that a little bit last yeah. night. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the locker room afterwards. We, we praised their effort because that's what we had demanded and, and really beat on them for four or five days mm -hmm. uh, as far as demanding. Uh, and we told them how proud we were of them. Obviously, we were. But in the same sense, too, we hit on the fact that, hey, let's not be satisfied with this because complacency can kill. And we're in no position to be complacent on anything. Uh, we know who we've got coming in yep. Thursday night, Saturday afternoon, and again on, and on Monday. Uh, and now we're going to see how hungry we really are uh, to play at home. I think we're going to be ready. Uh, I look forward to tomorrow's practice uh, in preparing for Middle Tennessee. I know Freddie's put together an awesome scout for him. He's done a big-time job as well as the Lipscomb game. I got it easy because all I have to do work out <laughs> is Concordia, and they're going to be pretty easy. But, uh, you know, I think we're going to be ready. We're going to be pretty focused. I wish we could chat more because I always enjoy it, but John says we're out of time. So <laughs> thanks a whole bunch for coming in. Uh, congratulations on the win last night and uh, continued su uh, success down the road. Thanks, thanks. Mike. Joe Pachota, Fred Andrews, the uh, able bodied assistants to Doug Nolan, the FDFW men's basketball team have been our guests. We'll take a break and we'll bring Doug back and get his perspective of these upcoming three games. That's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. century is coming and with it a thousand questions will your family ever be in harm's way will a small town in Texas be hit with a hurricane will your daughter ever need a new kind of blood treatment we have no crystal ball for the world that awaits just one promise we'll be there the good earth. It gives us everything. And now you can give something back. By becoming an Earth Team volunteer, you can help the Natural Resources Conservation Service care for the good earth. Right in your own community. It's the only earth we'll ever have. Help make it a better place for all of us. Call 1-888-LANDCARE to find out how. Challenge to join the elite. And if you succeed, if you can master your fear, outsmart your enemy, and never yield, even to yourself, you will be changed forever. The few, the proud, the Marines. Welcome back to Macedon Spotlight. We are rejoined once again by the head coach of the IPFW men's basketball team, Doug Nolan. Doug, we just uh, chatted not only with Terry Cowens, but with what I like to affectionately call your mutt and Jeff, uh, your assistants, Joe Pachota, Fred Andrews. You alluded in a segment that we had with you that they did a great job in the organization of uh, uh, in the preparation for this victory over Oakland. Now I'll put you on the spot. Uh, your true feelings about Joe and Fred as assistants? Well, no doubt, you know, the, um, the head coach uh, is on camera the most, talks in the paper the most, but, 
You know, obviously, so much goes on behind the scenes, and, you know, our basketball program would be nowhere without, you know, these two guys. Joe's been with me for three years, and Fred's been here now two years. And, um, you know, that's, that's really where, you know, I think everything that, that is about our program lies. I mean, uh, I have so much confidence in them that I'm able to get out and recruit during a week while we have practice. They can take practice. Uh, they can take – last year I went out to uh, uh, see a kid play – uh, in Kansas and flew back into St. Louis to meet up with the team and and I mean they can run everything from A to Z and sometimes I even wonder why they I'm around and they need me uh, because they can they can basically do everything each of them usually takes a team and then completely goes through that does our scouting report um, cuts the tape uh, you know 9 10 12 minute segments for our players goes over the scouting report with the players and, uh, you know, we have daily meetings and, and go through things. They have a lot of jobs. Uh, you know, each of them take half of the team and, and uh, are kind of academic advisors to our guys, make sure they're on track, uh, make sure that our guys are staying uh, within the parameters of what, what they need to stay, you know, within. And so uh, they're just so valuable. You know, I, I can't say enough about them. And, I, and sometimes I don't say enough about them. But, um, that's really our bread and butter is, is Joe and Fred and what they do. Um, you know, Fred really gets out on the road. I mean, he's going about every night or every night possible um, to see a, a kid play and, and really heads up our recruiting. Um, and, and then Joe really does a great job, I think, you know, on the floor, the teaching, uh, the coaching. And both of them are interchangeable. Both of them do all of that. But I think, you know, Fred leans towards that recruiting end of it because, you know, that's what, you know, his specialty is. He really likes that part of it. I think Joe really brings a sense of uh, that on the court presence, that knowledge, uh, the X's and O's part of the, of the uh, uh, really of the game and the game plan. But they both do a great job, you know, all the way through. And, and you know, like I said, I, I really can't say enough about them because they don't get, the, you know, the dues that, um, you know, uh, really are due to them. But uh, we, we couldn't do what we do without those guys, and, and so uh, I'm really indebted to them. We have a great time when we're on the road. I mean, we work very hard, and, and uh, it's all business, but uh, we kind of know what each other's doing and, and each other's uh, objectives, and that really helps. Well, as you mentioned earlier, too, we had nine days off between games between UIC and Oakland, and now it's going to get tough because there are three games coming up, in, uh, as you said, one day preparation for each. On Thursday night, we take on Middle Tennessee State. On Saturday, uh, in a game that we're going to broadcast here on uh, College 56 Sports, it's Lipscomb University out of Nashville, Tennessee. And then on Monday night, um, probably out of courtesy to Joe, maybe I'm guessing, a um, school that both he and I went to, Concordia, what used to be Concordia College of Ann Arbor, now Concordia University of Ann Arbor, Michigan, comes to town. Uh, talk first of all about the upcoming games and I know you always like to go one game at a time but since we're doing bang 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 three in a row talk about each opponent and then also talk about what you perceive as the possible difficulties of having to get the team up again because there was a nice high Monday night after the victory right. now you got to break them down in one day and say wait a minute we still got to go back to work got a tough team coming in here and we still have to perform at our best level so let's talk about each opponent and talk about what the game plan is to keep our team on an even keel for these three ball games coming up. Well, it's a little hard right now because, you know, we tend, or at least I tend, not to look ahead. Uh, now, Joe and Fred do that because they have to prepare the scouting reports. And um, I think Fred has two of those reports, and, and Joe's helping out with one of, uh, one of them that Fred's taking, and then Joe, I think, is going to uh, have Concordia College, but um, all three of them right now, as we speak, uh, have losing records. Um, Middle Tennessee State is is very close to 500. They're something like nine and 11 or 10 and 11, um, and very athletic. They're they're long. They're tall. Uh, they shoot the basketball pretty good, but they're one and eight on the road. And so, you know, we have to exploit those types of things with them. Uh, and again, Lipscomb is not having a, a, a good year per se, uh, and they probably look at us in the same vein as well. Uh, and then Concordia being an NAIA school, um, you know, it's uh, kind of 
you know, a help to Concordia to come up here, play us, and make a little bit of money. And we have Grace College where I coached and played uh, February 14th. So trying to help out a few of those programs like that. But uh, the main thing that we want to we want to look at with our kids is, okay, you know, this is not going to be a one-time shot or a one-night shot because we're not at the Coliseum now our next three games that makes no difference it makes no difference who we're playing you know we have to come out with the same intensity we have to be hungry again we have to just you know go 180 degrees again and say okay uh, Thursday night uh, you know is there going to be a crowd like there was at the Coliseum most likely not Indiana and Purdue are on TV okay a lot of people are probably going to stay home to watch them but does that really matter no I mean we have a game we have three games in a row now at home that are very winnable and uh, you know can we do that what I really like Mike is the fact that right now you know we have choices you know and we we have not everything uh, can you sit there and say well if we if we show up we can win if we show up if we play well if we make an effort if we outwork them if we out tough them if we do some things offensively and defensively to uh, negate maybe things that they do well uh, we have a shot to win and that's all you ask for I mean that's all you want as a coach you want a chance you know I can honestly say some, some of these games we played we don't have a chance to win we have a chance to play well we have a chance to stay within a, a striking distance and have a chance like a Michigan State to you know uh, keep the game close and feel good about, you know, our first year in Division One. But now we have a chance to win. And, you know, there's been a while since I felt like I did uh, Monday night. I mean, uh, just to be honest with you, I mean, in the past I've had successes with other programs, and sometimes you take it for granted, um, you know, how that euphoria feels after uh, a great battle, a great win, and, and we have played games that were close this year. We have played games against really tough opponents that we felt good about ourselves afterwards, but there's no doubt to feel good about how you play, to feel good about playing in front of a great big uh, crowd at the Coliseum, and then to win the game, you know, down the stretch in the last couple minutes with the crowd you know, in a frenzy and people cheering, and, and really they were the sixth man for us. Um, you know, that's a high that you can't get anywhere else but, but uh, coaching at the collegiate level and listening to that. And, you know, it's, it's not at Purdue or IU where they have, you know, 10, 12, 15,000 people, but, you know, it's our little area right now. And, and I, I think hopefully the, if the guys haven't learned anything from it, then, uh, you know, that's really a shame because right now we have some winnable games and we can't worry about if there's people there, we're not at the Coliseum, we're at the Gates Center. We just have to go out and really continue our high-level play, and hopefully that will take us through at least the next week. A couple of questions before we have to go. Uh, are you going to petition the MidCon to declare you conference champs since we're 2-0? Well, we have, uh, <laughs> you know, that would be nice to be in the, you know, at the top of the list right now. But, uh, um, you know, we have, uh, we have IUPUI yet. We go back to Chicago State again, and we end the year at uh, Missouri, Kansas City. So we basically have, uh, you know, five or a total of five, but we have three more, uh, I believe, mid-con games, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, I think we've shown some people that even in our transition year, even in a year where we're not fully funded, even in a year where uh, we had to recruit, uh, with the idea that we were going to have an eight-year wait. Um, I think we've, we've done a pretty good job surviving this year, even with all the, the obstacles that, that we've had to, uh, you know, uh, really face, uh, you know, right in front of us. I mean, when you lose some kids for injury, when you lose a, a player, um, you know, that you know, quits the team or you lose a player for academics, I mean, those things all take their toll on you. They, they all uh, just keep, you know, punching you in the stomach. And finally, you know, you've you got to go down for the count sometime. But the one really good thing that, I, that I've really appreciated with this team, even in the good and bad times when we haven't played as, as well as I thought we could play or the effort level wasn't there, I don't think we've quit. I don't think we've said we're not playing for anything this year, so <clears throat> we're not having success. Let's kind of throw in the towel. They haven't done that. In fact, more so uh, the reverse, and I think that's a, that's a big part of what Fred and Joe's done also, is, is the fact that 
we've, we've gone through this stretch, we've gone through these tough times, and now, you know, we've got some games that are winnable, and now we're applying some of the things that we've learned through a tough process, and now we're applying them, and, and that's just what we need to keep doing. And uh, there's been some long, long nights, but hopefully we'll have some more nights like Monday night. Once again, congratulations on the win, and uh, good luck in these upcoming three games. And uh, we'll not only see you live Saturday when we broadcast, but we'll talk to you again next week with, hopefully, uh, a chance to talk about a four-game winning streak. That'd be great, Mike. Doug Knoll, the head men's basketball coach here at IPFW, has been our guest. We thank Doug, along with his assistants, Joe Pachota, Fred Andrews, and Terry Cowens, member of the basketball team, for appearing on the show this week. And as always, we thank you, the viewer, for tuning in each week to Mastodon Spotlight to see what's going on with IPFW Athletics. We invite you to come back next week. We also invite you to tune in Saturday at 1 o'clock. If you can't make it out here in person to the Gate Sports Center, tune in to College 56 Sports as these IPFW Mastodons play host to Lipscomb University. But uh, that's it for this week. Until next week, this is Mike Moss saying, have a great week and go Dons. The IPFW men's basketball team continued playing in front of the home fans at the Hillier Gates Sports Center this past week. In fact, they played a total of three games. On this week's edition of Mastodon Spotlight, we'll visit with head coach Doug Knoll, look at some game highlights from one of those three games, and we'll talk with a couple of members of the basketball team as well in uh, junior Brad Knoll and sophomore Kian Henderson. Our show is called Mastodon Spotlight, and it's coming up next. Let me show you something amazing. This is Amanda. She was born with a serious skin condition. You're about to see it disappear. Some might call this magic, but the real magic's happened on the inside. A child's self-esteem has been restored. Don't let anything get in the way of being a kid. This is David Copperfield for the American Academy of Dermatology. Hi again, everybody. I'm Mike Moss. Welcome to another edition of Mastodon Spotlight. Well, as I said a moment ago, the IPFW men's basketball team has been enjoying something different the last uh, 10 days or so. They've been playing at home uh, in front of the home fans, both at the Memorial Coliseum and at the Hilliard Gate Sports Center, getting to wear the white jerseys. Something that was uh, not heard of in the first uh, two-thirds of the season, but uh, they've been at home. They've played some exciting basketball, some good results, some not so good results, and we have back with us this week the head coach of the Mastodons, Doug Knoll. And Doug, last week when we visited, uh, we ended on a high note because we had a, a very exciting 77-71 win over Oakland University at the Coliseum. And uh, as we finished that show, we were talking about the fact that we had three more games at home, chance to build on the momentum of that victory. Um, we're going to talk about those three games against... Um, 
Middle Tennessee State, Lipscomb University out of Nashville, and uh, Monday night we played uh, Concordia University from Ann Arbor, Michigan. But uh, before we actually talk about the games, talk about the preparation if you can. When we visited, obviously emotions were high, confidence was there, big win in front of over 2,600 fans, shot in the arm, but you knew you had three opponents to get ready for in a six-day period. Um, again, one of the concerns, at least my, from my end as a, an observer, one-day practice and preparation for each opponent. Now that that has passed, let's talk a little bit about that first, and then we'll talk about each of the ball games. Well, in a year where uh, you're an independent, you know, everything happens, you experience everything from no games on Saturdays uh, a lot of times, which is very unheard of. Uh, and it takes a while to get used to after all these years. But to, um, to really, uh, no games for uh, a large amount of time, and then all of a sudden you just pack it in uh, and have very little uh, time to get ready for the next game. And that's what we saw. We had to move a game, uh, the Ball State game, from uh, mid-January to the front of the season because of max scheduling and TV and, and all that. And that's some of the things you run into uh, once you get into Division One. So after our Illinois-Chicago game, which was at home against the Gates, or at the Gates Center, uh, we went nine days without a game. And then after that, once we got started, we went eight days with four games. So that's kind of uh, you know, what we've been used to this year. But uh, the schedule settles down uh, next year, even though we're still an independent for one more year, uh, or at least we hope. Uh, the, schedule, the schedule does settle down a little bit, and I think it's going to be a little more uh, it'll flow a little more freely for us to not have such big gaps. But those are things you do in, in your schedule, and, and uh, you take that in consideration. But, you know, we were prepared at Oakland, and, and um, you know, uh, we saw, saw that, uh, the fruits of our labor with that. They had a game Thursday, Saturday, and then us, and then had to go to Southern Utah. So our game stuck in there was not a big deal for them. Then we had a few days to get prepared for uh, Middle Tennessee State, uh, one day for Lipscomb and one day for Concordia. So uh, we really had to move fast and quickly. Actually, you know, Joe and Fred had to move ahead quite a bit uh, with the scouting reports. I don't like to look ahead as a head coach. I, I want to take one game at a time. That's their job is to look ahead. I'll look to the present right now because I may never get to that game, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I may not make it. But um, so it's been tough, but we've gotten through it. And what started to be a very good week, I think, uh, became somewhat of a little disappointment. It was kind of the bookends. We won Monday night, and the following Monday night we won, and Thursday, Saturday in between. We lost, and we lost uh, very close in both games, 10 to Middle Tennessee State, and it was three at half. Uh, it was six with about a minute and a half to go. And then in Lipscomb, we played one of our worst halves of the, the season in the first half, and probably one of our best in the second half. We scored 27 points the first half and doubled that to 54 the second half. It was just night and day. But, you know, we decided to play defense and put that first and foremost. And once we do that, then the defense was our best offense, and, and we focused on defense. Uh, where in the first half we focused on offense, we weren't very good, and we were worse on defense. So we got through it and uh, got the Concordia win again, and, and um, it was a good win for us, and, and now – we're looking to the weekend to uh, Loyola Chicago. Uh, well, let's, let's go back briefly, and we'll start with the Middle Tennessee State game. Uh, played at the Gates Center, so a little different venue instead of the Coliseum, back in the cozy <coughs> confines, as I like to say, of the Gates Center. I know it was a concern of mine, and I know I asked you last week, um, and I'm guessing in the back of your mind maybe there was a concern. Such a high on Monday night to get ready. Um, you gave the team Tuesday off, then you get ready, go through the walkthrough and everything on Wednesday for Middle Tennessee State. They come in here, or they did come in here, I believe they were either 9 and 11 or 10 and 11, uh, playing in the same Sunbelt Conference that Florida International, and you played them early in the season, uh, played them in. Didn't, as you say, didn't play the best of first halves, but we went in the locker room only down three at 41-38. Definitely a chance to, to come back and uh, snatch victory. It didn't happen. That second half, they made a spurt, and then it seemed like we were in a Six to ten point hole pretty much the rest of the way. Um, brief thoughts on that game, and then we'll get into Lipscomb. Well, Middle Tennessee State was uh, very athletic. Uh, they had uh, 10 or 11 kids that they rotated in all the time, and just they're very uh, transitional team. They run 
run hard down the floor. Uh, they use a lot of skip passes to, to uh, spot up for threes. I think they're very similar to us in the amount of uh, three-point attempts that they take during the game, 27 or 28. And uh, so we knew it was going to be kind of a wild shootout, and, and it ended up 80 to 90 uh, on their end. But uh, I, was, I was disappointed in the fact that, you know, we allowed them such easy shots most of the time. I know they shot, uh, I think, somewhere around 62% for the game. And, you know, when you're playing at home, Mike, you cannot have your opponents shooting above 50%. I mean, that's just, that's a big no-no. You, you've really got to use your home court advantage and make it hard for them uh, to get open looks. And we didn't do that. I mean, as well as we, we played offensively and we scored 80 points, uh, defensively we just weren't up for the challenge. And you're right, you hit it on the head. It is very difficult for teams to, you know, play a game at such a high emotion and a high peak and have success and then turn around and try to dial it up again. And, uh, but you know, good teams do that, great teams do that. And that's the things that we've struggled with this year is getting to be consistent on a consistent basis with effort, uh, with playing hard all the time and, and really working hard. And, and then, you know, to compound matters more, uh, you know, Keon Henderson got hurt during the game uh, and we don't know yet um, exactly uh, what's transpired. Uh, he did go down with a knee injury. Uh, he was trailing on the play and he tried to jump forward to block a shot and he came down fairly stiff-legged with his knee and we don't know if it hyperextended, if uh, the ACL is torn. Uh, we're hoping it's hyperextended uh, because obviously that's a lot less time and who knows, he may be back. The knee keeps responding every day in a positive way but again I'm not a doctor so uh, <laughs> you know I can't I can't say, you know, for sure. He's been on crutches, now he's off. And uh, uh, then again at Concordia, D went down with an ankle and only played five minutes or so. So that's been the frustrating part of our year this year. Not, not really the scheduling. I think we've handled that very well, even though it's been tough. But we've never had all our, our, our entire team at one time the whole year. And that really puts you in a bind, especially because, you know, we're not even a full Division I program yet. We're at the level of a Division II right now trying to play with the big boys. Next year we will be a full Division I uh, with scholarships and, you know, um, you know being uh, a, a counter but yet having an RPI and being a uh, full-fledged Division I. Uh, so that, that's, been the, that's really been the hard part this year, Mike, is trying to overcome all these injuries. Well, final score in that ball game was Middle Tennessee State 90, IPFW 80. One quick footnote, the Dons did have four players in double figures, Jeremy King with 18, uh, Nick Wise with 16, D'Angelo Woodall with 15, and Jim Kesnick with 13. So some good, some not so good in that ball game. We jump ahead to a game we broadcast last Saturday here on College 56 Sports, Lipscomb University out of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and the similarities, Dave Scout and I talked about that prior to the telecast beginning and in the early part of the telecast. Both teams making the transition to Division I. Both teams with the head coach in their third year at the program. Both teams came into that game with 16 losses, I believe, or 15 or 16. Neither team had won on the road. Both teams shooting 41% from the floor. Both teams shooting, I think, 33 or 34% from three-point range. We were 71% foul shooters. They were 70% foul shooters. It was like playing in front of yourself in front of a mirror. And as you said, we played horrible in the first half. And uh, you go in a locker room, you had to be upset. Your team's down 44-27. Uh, we're going to show some highlights in a minute in the uh, early part of the second half when uh, Middle Tennessee State stretched their lead. It, we're going to pick it up whenever you're ready, John, at uh, 46.30, I believe, or 47.30. But, uh, and here we go. And At this point, Doug, uh, obviously you had some words to say to your team. In the first few minutes, they weren't listening to you. Yeah, that's the difficult part, Mike, of, uh, you know, having so many games uh, right back to back to back, but I, I really felt like, you know, our team we really could have, we really could have used what we did Monday night. We we played 40 minutes, and we've been on the kids all year to play at a high level for 40 minutes. Here in the second half, we're down 17 yet, um, and that's what we were down, you know, to to start the second half. But we start to make a little bit of a run. Jeremy makes a nice spin move, gets an easy layup. But, you know, in, in Division I, and 
you know, everybody's going to play hard. Everybody's going to work hard. People are going to have a lot better athletes than some teams, but every team's going to work hard. And I think that's the one thing that we've done fairly well this year, but we haven't done as, as consistent as I'd like to have done it uh, so far, especially like in this game here. This was very winnable. Now, I think obviously we're, we're a lot more athletic than the Lipscomb team is, even though you commented that, you know, we're like a, a mirrored image of ourselves uh, in the fact that, you know, shooting percentages, records, the coaching situation, and they were able to come in and, and play with a lot of kids for one year at the NAI level um, and then jump in uh, to Division One. We just decided this year just to jump in at full force. I mean, we could have had 10 Division One games and 18 non-Division Ones like last, you know, like the Concordia game that we played. But we decided just to just to dial it up and and uh, play as good a people as we can, and and uh, that's what we wanted to do. Here, Matt Shepard <clears throat> makes a strong power move, uh, scores a basket, uh, and gets fouled. And this is kind of what we wanted to do. Uh, our our offense early in the first half against Lipscomb was very stagnant. Uh, we were standing, we weren't setting screens, we weren't moving. And what we did then, and what you have a tendency to do as a team, is you let your offense dictate your defense. And if your offense is very bad, then your defense is going to be very bad. Uh, when, when you allow your defense to dictate your offense, and you work hard and get some screens, uh, get, some, get some steals uh, off your defense, get some easy baskets, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, your, your, your offense looks sharper, your defense picks up, and the, the flow is much better. And that's what we did. I mean, we scored 27 the first half, as I mentioned, 54 the second half, and we were two different teams out there. I know one of the things that uh, you and I have talked about, I think one of your favorite uh, phrases in the three years that we've been able to do this is possessions. And you always feel if you're within two or three possessions with a couple of minutes to go, there's a chance we can pull it out. And uh, here's a case where, in essence, we were down six possessions at one point, and you're cutting it down, cutting it down. The guys, as you say, we saw the Matt Shepard move inside. We're going to see, you know, see some other shots being made. Um, we made a nice 25 to 10 run. We cut it to two at 54-52 with um, just under 11 minutes to go. But making that big move comes with the price from the emotional standpoint. And we got it to within two, but we just couldn't get in any closer. And uh, we ended up losing that game 85-81 had some chances, but uh, talk about the emotions when you fall behind so much, make the push to get back, and you've always talked about trying to go the four, full 40 minutes, that's hard. Well, there's no doubt, Mike, when you, when you dig yourself a hole and then you have to recover uh, in a short amount of time, you, you expend so much energy uh, mentally and physically getting back to trying to you know, pull the game to even one possession at a time. And that's what we talked to the guys about at halftime, you know, that the effort wasn't there. Uh, mentally, we weren't in the ball game. We weren't sharp. And I can tell right off the bat, especially when we're missing free throws. And when we miss free throws, it's lack of concentration because we're a pretty good free throw shooting team. And this was one of the, uh, uh, the Achilles heels that really hurt us in this game. I mean, we lose by four and we miss 14 free throws. We go 20 of 34 from the line. You know, if we shoot 72% or whatever that we're shooting, we win the ball game. Uh, and that's the frustrating part right now of games that, you know, we can win. We, we use the first half of the season as a springboard for the second. And the first half was very difficult. And there's games that we weren't going to win no matter how good we played. But the second part of the season now, if we play well, we've got a shots to win as, as the Oakland game, as we saw in, in the Chicago State game. And definitely the Middle Tennessee State and the Lipscomb games were very winnable games. And, you know, for, for whatever reason, we did not uh, take the Oakland win and, and use that to, uh, you know, to, to help us in, in these other two games. And for what reason, you know, I don't know. I wish I did. Maybe we could have <laughs> made an adjustment. Uh, and that's the frustrating part because, <clears throat> you know, sometimes I think our guys don't think we're a as good as the coaches think we are. But it all comes down to to really effort, you know, attitude and effort uh, in, in being ready to play, competing for 40 minutes. In the Middle Tennessee game, I thought we competed for 30 minutes. In the Lipscomb game, maybe 20. Uh, but when we competed and we got after it, you know, we brought it back. But you look at it, and they just shot again, the second team in two days, uh, in three days, to come into our gym and shoot 55-plus percent uh, from the field. And 
you know, we just cannot allow that. We can't allow that, you know, at home, on the road, whatever. I mean, a great field goal, defensive field goal percentage is under 40. If you can hold teams under 40, you're going to win a lot of games. If you let them shoot 55 or better, you're not going to win very many games. And that was our, that was our case. And then to compound that, we go to the line and miss a lot of freebie opportunities, uh, which was a lot mental as far as I'm concerned. And there it is. They have seven assists, 23 turnovers. We only have about 10 turnovers. Uh, but the bottom line is, in the second half, we took 30 shots. They took 16, which is, is a huge differential. Uh, and we outscored them by 13 and scored 54 points. But uh, again, the bottom line is their field goal percentage and our lack of making free throws cost us the game. Now, final scores, we said 85-81. And then Monday night, um, again, to finish the homestand, we played Concordia. It's not Concordia University out of Ann Arbor. An NAIA school. Remember the WAC conference with Tri-State Indiana Tech. Uh, a game, obviously, we thought we should have won. Had some trouble early on. And at one point, uh, like two minutes to go and a half, we're only up six. But we had a little bit of a run the last couple of minutes. We are up 41-28 at the break. A uh, couple of players busted out. We ended up winning 81-60. Nick Wise had 22 points. Terry Collins, 17. Uh, Brad Noll, 15, his best game of the year, I thought, or uh, one of the two. And uh, Jeremy King with 10. So we came to life a little bit, ran the ball, pushed the ball, uh, and we came away with a W. Uh, which was important as we get ready for this weekend. Right, no doubt. Uh, this was a game that, uh, you know, going in, uh, we should win, and uh, we should win big. Uh, and, and again, I wasn't so uh, worried about the first half and, and how we performed. I just wanted to see uh, some effort because I thought the first two non-Division one games we played, we really weren't sharp. Uh, it was kind of like we got to go through the motions. <clears throat> and on the other end, they're coming in, in in much the same way we've approached all year uh, with that trump card. We're not supposed to win. They're not supposed to win last night. So they came in loose, and they had a couple injuries as well, but they're, they're always going to play hard. And, and uh, we stretched it out 41-28, and then we really played some good basketball for about um, 15 minutes, and we got the score to 31, and I think it was somewhere around 74-43, with about five minutes to go, and I was really pleased with our defense. And then we made some substitutions, and our subs down the stretch did not play well the last five minutes. Instead of closing it out, uh, and we probably should have taken it from 31 to, to 40 or 35, we took it down to 21. And, and uh, you know, you leave that game not feeling good about yourselves because of the last five minutes. But I thought all in all, the starters played great. I thought Brad came in and, and really did a nice job. Last night, getting back into the flow, uh, Nick was himself, but I thought the two keys, Jeremy King had a double-double, and he had 13 rebounds, which was big, uh, to go along with 10 points, and he didn't force anything. He was very patient, but I thought really probably the star of the game was Terry Collins, uh, 17 points, but he had six rebounds, he had six steals, and he had six assists, and uh, he played about 30 minutes and didn't play the last five minutes, but uh, you know we were trying to get ready for... Uh, this coming Saturday, but I thought Terry really came back and played well after playing well uh, a Monday night ago with 25 against, uh, against Oakland. So um, we had some good, good uh, people step up, uh, four and double figures, I believe. Uh, it was a good win for us. I would have liked to close the game out a little stronger, and uh, you know we have some work to do there. But uh, a winnable game that we thought we could win, um, but you know we've got to continue to play for 40 thought we played for 35 last night, and that's not good enough. Time for a break. When we come back, we're going to visit with a couple of members of the basketball team. We'll start off with uh, junior guard Brad Knoll. That's when Macedon Spotlight returns in just a moment. Excuse me, could you tell me where the Blackstone building is? Ding-a-dong. Hee-haw? 
Excuse me, could you tell me where the Blackstone building is? Uh, Ragtag Smokestar Shabibo. When others can't understand you, and you can't understand others. The Blackstone building? I'm not to like a mishmash. Then you have a clue what it's like to live with a communication disorder. Millions of Americans are born with these conditions. For millions more, problems develop later in life. Speech, language pathologists, and audiologists are developing new treatments and new technologies that bring people together. You don't happen to know where the Blackstone building is, do you? Shenandoah. For more on communication disorders and where to find help, call 1-800-638-TALK. Shenandoah Street, two blocks down. Thank you. Thank you very much. A public service message for the American Speech Language Hearing Association. If we do not take responsibility for saving animals from extinction, we allow a part of ourselves to die with them. Help World Wildlife Fund protect animals in the places where they live by ordering a free action kit. Together, we can leave our children a living planet. Come in, she said, I'll give you shelter from the storm. A new century is coming, and with it, a thousand questions. Will your family ever be in harm's way? Will a small town in Texas be hit with a hurricane? Will your daughter ever need a new kind of blood treatment? We have no crystal ball for the world that awaits. Just one promise. We'll be there. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. Time now for one of our student athlete interviews uh, here on the program. And uh, we welcome back for the third time, I believe, to Mastodon Spotlight, junior guard Brad Knoll. Thank you. Monday night, Concordia Ann Arbor. 31 minutes of action, season high 15 points. Uh, let's talk about that ball game first because uh, it was by far your best offensive output of the year. Um, yeah, Concordia, they were a little smaller team, so uh, we could afford to go with a little smaller lineup. Uh, you know, it was unfortunate that uh, D'Angelo got hurt right, uh, right off the bat, and, you know, so that, you know, that kind of forced me into the lineup a little quicker. Um, you know, it was, any team, you ha anytime you have a team like that that, uh, you know, is a little smaller, you know, they're, they're going to be smarter. Uh, they execute pretty well, you know, what they do best. And, you know, we just, you know, we tried to, you know, Run it, run it up the court on them, uh, get it down to our big guys, and you know just see what we could do with that. I'm not going to say it's a new wrinkle, but a pleasant wrinkle that I saw in that ball game on your behalf. You took it to the basket on numerous occasions, and that's something that we haven't always seen here in the last three years because uh, your forte has been the outside jump shot. Uh, talk about the difference in strategy. Um, well, obviously with the smaller lineup that they have, uh, I felt I could get to the basket a little easier than, um, you know, perhaps before. But, you know, it's just something that just opened up. Uh, you know, I, I drove to the basket uh, a couple times in the first half, and I really felt comfortable with it. And, you know, also our shooters were spotting up, and I could, you know, get them the ball as well. Got a comment. This is off, off uh, the beaten track, but we kidded about it last night, and your mom was there as well. Uh, you broke team unity. You wore a different color sneaker. But it's the sneaker you said you feel comfortable with. Yeah, it's uh, it's not the uh, I guess the color uh, per se. But uh, I rolled my ankle about a week ago, and in practice I'm wearing an ankle brace. And for those shoes are uh, kind of a lower cut, and it's basically the only shoe I have that's comfortable with that ankle brace. Uh, a lot of the other shoes I have are a little higher, and it feels like a boot when I'm wearing it. And you know I kind of like to still have the you know stability and plus the comfort. So. For the benefit of our viewers, instead of the white with blue trim, um, it's a two-tone, looks like a pair of golf shoes, uh, like black and dark blue or blue and gray or something like that. Uh, God-awful color shoes, but uh, if, they're, if they're comfortable and you score 15 points, what the heck? Right. Talk about this season, Brad. It's, a, it, it's the second uh, transitional year, so to speak, for IPFW basketball. Next year, it's almost exclusively D1 schedule, pretty much D1 schedule this year, except for the four NAIA opponents. Uh, what's this year been like for you? Um, I guess 
most most of all, it kind of seems like we're all freshmen again, trying to learn the ropes and seeing, you know, how everyone else does things. Um, you learn real quickly that every big team that we play is very consistent. They play for 40 minutes and they play extremely hard and there's no let-ups. And I guess that's probably, you know, the, the biggest difference between, you know, Division One schools and, and how we need to prepare for them. Um, it's taken a while for us to adjust, but there's been some real positive things that we can take uh, from this year. And I think, you know, each, each game, you know, we're showing signs of improvement. And, you know, if we can improve on the little things each game that we're doing well, you know, we're going to be pretty successful in the future. I think as we tape this, there are six games left in your season. I want to go back briefly and look at four of them and briefly your thoughts on them. And, and those four games are the game in uh, November 30th at Michigan State in front of almost 15,000 fans. You got to play the Spartans. Uh, a few days later, up at Chrysler Arena in Ann Arbor, took on the University of Michigan. Uh, and the two games where we have recorded wins, where we were unbeaten in the Midcon, the victory at home over Chicago State, and then a week ago, uh, this past Monday night, at the Coliseum against Oakland. Briefly talk about those four games, what they meant to you individually, and what you think they meant as a team to play a Big Ten opponent and to get two wins against Division One opponents. Um, I think... First off, uh, playing the Big Ten opponents, we, you know, we were respectable in the outing that we played them. Um, you know, losing the, by 13 to Michigan State, you know, no one wants to have moral victories, you know, throughout the year. But it, it's something you take and something that you build on, and you know, something you can sell. You know, recruits our schedule. You know, Michigan, Michigan State. You know, who doesn't want to play? You know, the best. And when you look at it, given given the chance that we had to to play those opponents, you know, it was really you know, something where you looked at, you know, you circled it on the calendar, uh, you, you knew it was going to be a big game, and, you know, you just tried to, you know, play for 40 minutes, compete with them, and in the end be, you know, proud of, you know, the, uh, the accomplishments that you hope, hope to make. Um, the other two games, Chicago State and Oakland, were uh, very big games as well, as uh, everyone knows we're trying to get in the mid-continent, and I think that as a team we really came ready to play those games, and you know, when, when the game was over, really looked back and, and it was two games that we really executed, played well, and, you know, we just, we deserved the win those games. Two questions left, I think, before this segment runs out. You're playing a different role this year in that you're coming off the bench more as opposed to starting. What's that transition been like? Um, it's, at times it's difficult. Uh, other times it's, you know, I just kind of roll with the punches. Whatever, whatever I'm asked to do, I'm going to try and provide for the team. If it's to, you know, go in there and, you know, give our point guards a little relief, that's fine. If it's to spot up and shoot the ball, if it's to drive and, you know, kick to our shooters, uh, whatever the case may be, I'll just, you know, try and, you know, help the team, you know, even if, if it's the little things, if it's, you know, trying to help them out and encourage them, uh, whatever, whatever the coaches ask, basically, uh, I'm going to try and do. And obviously it's been different, but at the same time it's also rewarding to, uh, you know, see all the other players grow as well. Final question, you've been involved off-season, uh, attending and working at various camps. Uh, briefly talk about some of the camps you worked at, what you hope to do this summer, and how it benefits you. Um, right now I'm still undecided as far as what I want to do, uh, getting into coaching or uh, my major's uh, marketing. And so either the business route or the coaching, it's, it's kind of maybe even a mix of both. But I have worked a couple camps this summer. Um, the two big ones were the Michigan State and uh, Purdue camps that I worked. Uh, Michigan State was, you know, just a fine quality camp. Everything was run to perfection up there. And it just goes to show, you know, what the staff is made of up there. Um, Purdue, it was, it was fun. Um, had a lot of good times. It was hard. But uh, I enjoyed both of them, learned a lot from them. Uh, also, I work at uh, Centennial Wireless part-time in the summer, just trying to, you know, get my feet wet in business and to experience some things that, you know, you don't get in the classroom. Well, we appreciate you coming on. In case it's the third time set off air, you probably want your SAG card after yeah. this. But uh, congratulations uh, on the real good ball game against Concordia. And uh, good luck in these final six ball games the rest of this season and, of course, next season as well. Thank you. Brad Noah has been our guest, member of the IPFW men's basketball team. We'll take a break. And when we come back, one of Brad's teammates, Keon Henderson, will visit with us. But that's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment.
Hi, I'm Amanda Tapping. On Stargate SG-1, my character discovered that the Stargate could be used as a key to unlock an endless variety of adventures. Your key for endless adventure is a good education. Don't limit your options. Stay in school. The good earth. It gives us everything. And now you can give something back. By becoming an Earth Team volunteer, you can help the Natural Resources Conservation Service care for the good Earth. Right in your own community. It's the only Earth we'll ever have. Help make it a better place for all of us. Call 1-888-LANDCARE to find out how. For over three decades, Dr. James Owen has been credited for helping IPFW become a top-rated school through not only teaching, but also his involvement in the Fort Wayne community. The kind of people that the city were hiring at the time were people with advanced computer skills. I thought, my lord, unless my students get up to speed in this particular area, uh, skill and talent, knowledge, uh, they weren't going to be competitive in the job market. Dr. Owen developed courses that would train his students to become leaders in the community. At one time, of the six major department heads in the city of Fort Wayne, uh, three of them were former students of mine that I'd recommended for the job. He makes a point to stay in touch with former students, and that makes a difference in their lives. Uh, whenever I think about undergraduate days, I always think about old professor so-and-so. She said, I have one like that, too. And she said that that's Dr. Owen. IPFW, the right school, right here, right now. Welcome back to Macedon Spotlight. We are going to now visit with another student athlete here at the university, another member of the men's basketball team. We welcome to Macedon Spotlight, Kian Henderson. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I don't know if there's much to tell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just a ordinary guy. I like to play basketball. Uh, come from a, a religious background, and uh, the, one of the reasons I ended up here in Fort Wayne was because uh, of a pastor that I knew in the city. Uh, and he, he told me of his interest that he would like me to come and uh, work with him in, in his church. And so uh, it was just a good opportunity. As a matter of fact, on my recruiting visit uh, here with Coach Noel, uh, I was at a state convention uh, at True Love Baptist Church on the south side of town. So I was running from uh, being over here with Coach Noel and a few of the guys to going to church at night. So uh, it's not really much, just me. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you come to us from Gary, Indiana not too far from Chicago. They play some pretty good basketball over there. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your high school career. Uh, well, I, I think that one of the things that Coach Knowles always talks about, uh, how I develop each year uh, and get better each year is uh, as a direct result of the kind of high school I went to. I mean, we had a, a guy, Ricky Wright, he went to Villanova, and uh, a guy, Bobby Smith, he went to Villanova, and uh, another guy, Marcus Jefferson, he, he, he started out at Providence, and then now he's at Iowa State. Um, uh, Willie Davis went to Wichita State. Uh, just a, a lot of guys who went Division I. Um, Antoine Woods went to Weber State, and th we were all on the same high school team. So I was just— Which high school now, Gary? Uh, East Chicago Central. East Chicago Central. Not far from Gary. I drove mm -hmm. to school uh, every day. So <laughs> uh, I moved to Gary my senior year of high school and didn't really want to transfer schools my senior year, so I just stayed there. But uh, like I was saying that, you know, I was just one of those guys who uh, was waiting in the, in, the, in the sort of in the balance, waiting for my turn because we had such talented guys uh, who were there. Uh, so when I got my opportunity, I really only had uh, that one year, my senior year of, of experience where I, would, where I would play major minutes, you know. So the school has a tradition of producing great players. Oh, I, we had another guy, Carlton Baker, uh, who was uh, a junior, uh, J junior college All-American, and he uh, ended up going to San Jose State. I don't know if he's still there or not. So we just had a, we had a good team, and it's always been like that. So now I'm getting my opportunity to, to, to develop my gifts and talents. You're six feet five. When you came here two years ago, I think if you were lucky, you were 160 pounds. <laughs> I think that's stretching a little bit. <laughs> um, now you're up closer to, what, 190, 200, yes. somewhere in that area. So you've had a chance to hit the weight room a little bit. Uh, 
one of the things I noticed, you're the reigning slam dunk champion for IPFW at Midnight Madness. You've won it both years. I know um, on some of our broadcasts in the past of men's basketball, um, I've mentioned the fact, comparing you to some degree to Jamal Wilkes, in the fact, you're about 6'5", I think he was 6'6". Six, six. You're smooth. You can jump like crazy, and you can, uh, I term you what we call an impact player, uh, a great role player, where you can come in, and there have been some times where you've been able to inject instant offense um, last year, this year. The one problem we've had is that you've been stuck by the, or by the injury bug, and right now you're out injured, uh, as Coach mentioned, uh, against Middle Tennessee State. Uh, you hurt your knee. Uh, as far as you know, the extent of your injury right now? Uh, well, the, the extent of it is uh, he, the doctor told me his impression was ACL, but he didn't know because it was too swollen to tail uh, at the moment. But uh, I think the injury comes as a result of uh, when I was in high school, like you said, I was, you say I play smooth, and I, I kind of took that. That was the way I played in high school. I just coasted and I was able to. I wouldn't say... Um, didn't say I wouldn't say do magnificent things. We have great players, but I was able to do great things uh, just off ability. A lot of guys were not as athletic, uh, if you will. So I was able to get by. And when I got here, my body wasn't used to the uh, working as hard. Uh, there's a big difference between high school and college. So uh, when my body was introduced to that hard method, it, it kind of responded. I had a back injury my first year. And uh, then a year following, I broke my foot, but I didn't miss. You know, I was able to play on that and it got better, and then this year, getting toward the end of the season, uh, this happened, so it's frustrating, but uh, all in all, it hasn't kept me out of uh, many games. Uh, and hopefully, if the MRI results, if we ever are able to get to taking this week, yeah. if it comes up hyperextended, you may still get a chance to possibly rehab and see some action before this year is over. Yes. Coach mentioned, you mentioned that religion is important in your life, and Coach mentioned that you are an ordained minister. Uh, how did that come about? And the second part of that question, how have your teammates reacted to that? The fact that they have an ordained minister as a teammate. Has it been good, bad, or indifferent? Well, uh, it, it came about uh, being a Christian and in the Baptist uh, religion, we believe that uh, God calls preachers. You know, he, he sets aside people who, who he wants to do it. So it wasn't something that I chose. Uh, it was something that I was called to do. And I'd always said as a, a young youngster, uh, if you will, or younger than I am now, that I wouldn't be a preacher. I have a father uh, who's a pastor of a nice-sized congregation at home and a couple of brothers that are preachers and a grandfather and you know, a host of other family members who are involved in the church. So it was just something I was uh, indefinitely born into, something that I was destined to do. Uh, my father always says it was just, it was just what I was going to be. It's just what I, it's who I am. Uh, and so I've accepted that role, and uh, it's not difficult for me because it, it just comes natural. Uh, I'm, I'm me, you know. I don't, I don't uh, force my religion on people, but I'm always talking uh, to people about why, you know, I'm able to overcome tough situations without uh, serious mental strain. Is because I have someone else, uh, God, if you will, to to rely upon for strength in those situations. Uh, as far as my teammates are concerned. Uh, they they respond well to me. They they know when it's time to joke and they know when I'm serious. Uh, they know how to respond to me as Keon, the regular person, and not as uh, respond to me as Keon, uh, the ordained minister. That's not much of a difference. I'm me wherever I go. It's just uh, I have to uh, take on a, a certain responsibility in the different frames uh, that I'm in. So I don't I don't act different uh, anywhere that I go. I'm just the same, you know, me wherever I am. And it's helping you, especially now, dealing with the injury. Yes. Uh, I, I make sure that we pray in the locker room before the game, and uh, I make sure we pray. And I always say at the end of our prayer that in the end, when we win, we'll give your name the praise, whether we win or not. That's just something I have instilled in, in the player's mind. And when we win, we get together half court, and we pray and thank God for the ability that he's given us uh, to win the game. I'm told we're out of time, but uh, I appreciate you coming on. We wish you well with the injury. Thank you. And uh, real quickly, your field of study here at the university. Oh, well, uh, my initial field of study was uh, communications, 
Uh, but now I've switched uh, my major to OLS, and now I'm minoring in communication. We wish you well with that. Hopefully you'll get better soon, and uh, we'll see you back on the court. Thank you. Keon Henderson has been our guest, member of the men's basketball team. We'll take another break and bring the head man, Doug Noll, back as we look ahead to this upcoming uh, couple of games with Loyola of Chicago and with IUPUI. But that'll happen when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. Time now to bring the head coach of the IPFW men's basketball team back to the show, Doug Noll. And Doug, uh, we gave you a little break, and uh, we brought your son Brad on for the third time since he's been here. And we also had a chance to speak to Keon Henderson. Your thoughts on those two players? Well, it's uh, they're both roommates, and uh, <laughs> along with D'Angelo, so that's uh, you know that's three guys that. Uh, have really brought a lot to our program. Um, you know, it's kind of difficult at times to, to coach your son, uh, not as difficult uh, to coach the other kids. But uh, I, it's, been a, it's been a great experience so far, and, and uh, the three of them get along, you know, really well. And, and uh, you know, Brad struggled this year a little bit in the, in the role that, <coughs> excuse me, he's, he's looking to play because last year he was strictly our two guard even though he doesn't have a lot of size um, he averaged almost 15 points a game for us now this year he's averaging about six or seven and uh, you know he's playing maybe 16 18 minutes a game uh, and, and it's, it's different for him but I think he's handling it really well he does a great job as a leader uh, on the court but off the court as well I mean he's always cheering for the other guys he's always encouraging and, and I really find that um, you know, really, really a blessing that, that you know, he, he's looked at it as a positive. And, and uh, so I think that's, you know, some of the things he brings us, a great work ethic. And, and uh, you know, it was nice to see a good game out of him against uh, uh, Concordia. And as I mentioned, uh, both uh, Michigan and Concordia, both from Ann Arbor, he had pretty good games against. So, uh, you know, maybe you ought to transfer to Michigan as last year or something. <laughs> or get Ann Arbor Huron and Ann Arbor Pioneer on a schedule yeah, as well. Yeah, so that, that's that been great. And then, of course, Keon, uh, you know, he's been here three years as well with Brad, but uh, he's, you know, he got a medical red shirt the first year, and, and he's uh, uh, just a sophomore this year as far as uh, eligibility in basketball goes. And unfortunately, again, uh, he's been, been dinged up and, and hurt a little bit, and we don't know um, exactly what yet is, uh, you know, I guess the outlook because uh, the doctor is going to come this week and, and really try to take an evaluation again of the knee. It's been swollen and could be hyperextended. The ACL uh, could be torn, but we're just hoping for the first one that it's hyperextended and maybe we can get him back, you know, this year. But uh, again, with Keon, you know, he came in uh, a, a thin 165. <laughs> He's about 200 right now. And uh, with his demeanor and everything, uh, you know, the, the toughness part and, and uh, the physical part was not yet there. But we can see just, you know, leaps and bounds as, as far as, um, you know, uh, not only his ability and learning to play at each level, uh, because it was a uh, he had a great high school program and a great high school team, and, and a lot of those kids went Division One. He went Division Two, took another step to Division One, and I think as as time goes, he's really growing into that. Uh, a couple points that I see is the the Coliseum game with Oakland. Uh, he had nine points, about five rebounds. Uh, he was probably one of the keys in our victory down the stretch. Um, the one play he took it in hard, just got just got nailed. But he, you know, he is bulked up enough now that he got the shot up on the glass. It rolled around the rim, fell in. He, he made a, the end one for a three-point play. Uh, late in the second half, Jeremy King went up, uh, got the ball stripped. Keon was right there, stuck it back in. Uh, so, you know, he is continually getting better uh, each and every game, each and every year. 
And uh, as he continues mentally and physically to get tougher, uh, his athleticism and ability continues to rise. And it's just been great to see that. And of course, then in speaking about both of them and, and uh, you know, um, both are just outstanding young men, uh, great students. And of course, Keon is an ordained minister. Uh, so, you know, that rubs off on the team and, and helps us a lot uh, with all the trials and things that we go through, all the injuries we've had. Uh, and, and kids look to him for leadership. And, and uh, you know, and, and, and Brad brings some of that too. But, um, you know, both of them are just really a joy to coach, uh, as well as the other guys. Uh, but it's been, it's been great that, you know, we have Brad for another year and then Keon for two more years. Before we look ahead to the next two ball games, just to go back to finish the points with both Brad and with Keon. I asked Brad the question, for two years he was a starting guard. This year he's coming off the bench. And with Keon, he's been a role player. The first question is, how do you feel Brad has taken the news of making the role adjustment change from being on the floor at the start of the game to coming in off the bench and really talk about what it is, not only with Brad and with Keon, but with the members, understanding their roles on the team. What that process has been like and what it is like, because that's one of the toughest parts of your job. Yeah, well, the toughest part's not really pleasing Brad, it's pleasing Brad's mom, <laughs> you know, that uh, I really have some tough times, you know. But uh, <clears throat> I, think he's, I think he's taken his role in stride. I think he realizes that, you know, each year, we're going to bring it, try to bring in a higher level of players, and so far each year we've had, you know, we've had a nice jump in scholarships to this year, where we were playing a full Division One schedule. We were a Division One counter, so now the talent level we were going to bring in, um, you know, was was better than last year, and next year we want it to be better than this year and the following year, and so on and so on. But each player that stays in the program each year for them, they must take their uh, game and abilities. To another level through the summer by working very hard. So, you know, Brad's in a difficult role because number one, he's the coach's son. Number two, he's gone from playing a lot, almost 33 minutes a game, to probably 18 minutes a game. That's that's difficult, um, but I think he's handled it very well. I think all the kids know that he's probably one of the hardest workers on the team, and his attitude has been great. And I'm most proud of that. I mean, uh, you know, the accomplishments. Are, are okay and, and fine, and, and he's not played like he did last year. But, um, you know, uh, just, you know, having him recognize what we need has been, has been really good uh, from that standpoint. And then again with Keon, each year, you know, he's playing a little more. You know, from Division Two to Division One, he's even upped his minutes a little bit. And, and we look forward to him, you know, upping them uh, next year. And the key for Keon is not September to March, it's March to September because uh, everybody plays September to March because that's when your season is. So nobody really uh, gets to uh, get a head start. But as soon as the season's over, you know, what happens then? You know, we get to work a little bit with the kids and give them a slight break, but then come back and start going through our individual workouts again uh, to the summer when we can only, you know, condition them. They have to play on their own. But what Keon does and what Brad does and what most of our guys do from March to September is going to, you know, really determine how much better we get next year because our schedule is similar. I mean, it's, it's going to be good from here on out. We want to play good teams. Um, but these guys have to lead the rest of our kids and our new freshmen and our new players and say, you know, this is how we do it here and this is what we expect. And that's when you start to have a program where, you know, the coaches feel good about because the players take hold of it. Um, I'd like to see that leadership become a little better from a lot of the kids, especially D'Angelo, Brad, and Keon, uh, because they've been here three years now, and they know what we expect as coaches, and hopefully they'll do that. Let's look ahead now. This coming Saturday, you go to the Windy City, and you're going to take on the Ramblers of Loyola, Chicago, a member of the Horizon League. Um, as we tape this show, they are 12-9 and nine overall, 7-4 and four in the conference, two games out of first. Uh, they just lost their last game to conference leader, Wisconsin-Milwaukee, ironic because uh, I mentioned that because Bruce Pearl, who you did battle with at Southern, who, when he was at Southern Indiana, is now the coach uh, up there. And uh, they, uh, they won uh, their last ball game, I think it was either 80 to 70 or 90 to 80. Well, as I tend to do, uh, you know, when we have a break of this much, 
from a Monday night game to a Saturday night game. I usually work uh, Tuesdays uh, going back and looking at the game Monday night uh, because we've got a little more of a luxury to do that. I want to find out some of the things we didn't do, some of the things we did well, and really try to work on those you know, throughout the week, even though we're starting to you know, uh, turn our attention to Loyola and get ready for them. Uh, Joe's working on the scouting report for Loyola right now, so he's in the midst of that, and I haven't really even looked at it, but I know they're, they're going to be very difficult to play. They, they beat uh, Illinois Chicago at Loyola, and uh, Illinois Chicago came down here and uh, we you know, know what hammered, they did. <laughs> hammered on us pretty good. But, uh, you know, I think from that standpoint, uh, we're going to be ready to play them. Uh, we've, got, we've got a stretch now of about uh, four or five days that uh, we can prepare for them. Um, you know, we're going to, we, we come back on Tuesday, have a light practice, look at film from the Concordia game. Wednesday we have off. And then Thursday we're going to, you know, gear back up again for that practice. Friday we'll be in Chicago and work out at Loyola. And then, of course, it's a Saturday game. In the meantime, uh, Thursday I'm taking off to Mississippi to uh, recruit a kid. <laughs> and then I'll fly into Chicago and meet up with the team Friday night and be there for practice. And then Saturday, of course, you know, like I said, it's a game. And I hope to get back to Warsaw Saturday night in time to hopefully see my daughter in Carroll High School uh, play against somebody. Uh, First Wallace, <laughs> Warsaw, Columbia City, or East Noble, or somebody. And hopefully they've got a win against DeKalb. So my, my week's pretty full with basketball, which is this is the greatest time of the year, February and March, because <laughs> of March Madness and, and then uh, going down. But uh, you realize that, you know, as we're taping this, we're only three more weeks of our season and six more games. And, and so, um, you know, it's going to go fast. And, and uh, in some ways, we are excited about the future of IPFW with the recruits we have sitting out with some of the new recruits we've signed and a couple more that we want to bring in because I think in all in all we may have six or seven new recruits next year which has got to help you know we've got to plug some holes in this team uh, and then have our other guys coming back really you know uh, take a take a big step up in their ability as I mentioned over the summer so it's all a process but uh, you know, we'll worry about uh, Loyola as, uh, you know, we start. Joe's already working on them, but we'll worry about them as a team about midweek. I'll take some things with me to start, you know, working on that as, as I'm on the road, and, and uh, hopefully we'll be ready Saturday. And then one final thought. I know you don't like to look at it, but since you're going to be on the road next week, we're going to hopefully talk with Bruce Patterson and talk women's basketball. IUPUI, Ron Harper and his team, member of the MidCon, uh, Good, better, and different. They're fighting in their conference. And one thing that they can say, they went down to Atlanta. And uh, when the fire was still, uh, still smoldering, they came away with a 95-92 victory over ACC member Georgia Tech. Uh, doesn't matter. Maybe that had a, Georgia Tech had a couple of players hurt. Bottom line, IUPUI 95, Georgia Tech 92, IUPUI not to be uh, dealt lightly with. Well, and, and you're right, Mike. I mean, we don't use the fact that Oakland had you know, two games uh, the previous four days before they played us, and one Saturday night was Valparaiso, and then they went to Southern Utah, which in between two big powers in the Midcon, they had to play us, and maybe that was a distraction for them. The same way, IUPUI doesn't look and say, well, Georgia Tech may have had a couple guys hurt. They beat Georgia Tech, the ACC. And Georgia Tech's, you know, having a tough year this year, but anytime you can beat uh, a power conference like that, it's huge. And Ron Hunter's done a just a fabulous job this year uh, and they keep taking you know steps up with their program each year they're getting a little better they're getting uh, you know better recruits in and, and that's really what it takes I mean <clears throat> I think really we're we're doing a lot better our first year than they did in their first year of transition uh, if you want to gauge it from that standpoint uh, yeah and I know they're their first year, I mean, there were several games that they played. They were getting beat, you know, 35, 40, 45 points. Uh, and that's really not happened to us this year. And I've been pleased with, you know, how competitive we've, we've been. And basically a year where we've just had a, a ton of injuries. And, and, uh, and that's been the frustrating part. But uh, I think, you know, if we can get in the mid-con, this will be a great rivalry. IUPUI and IPFW, uh, as well as us and Valpo, and have the three Indiana schools. Uh, but for right now... Um, you know, they've got a leg up. They've been in Division One a little bit longer. Uh, they've got the 13 full rides. 
uh, where we don't yet. But we're going to throw all that out, and next Tuesday when we go down there, we're going to be ready to play. Hopefully, the kids will understand what type of rivalry this is, you know. And, um, we, you know, we have to look at it. We've got six more games, five on the road. We haven't won a road game yet. And uh, I, I, I wasn't going to bring that up. <laughs> I, well, I'll bring it up because, uh, you know, I tell it like it is. I mean, uh, you know, if we continue on, you know, then we're going to look at, say, 6-22. and 22, And I hope that's not how we finish because we still have Chicago State again on the road. Youngstown is having a tough year. They're very beatable. But we have to play for 40 minutes. If we don't, we'll get beat. And I always tell the kids two things. Number one, you've got to go out and compete for 40 minutes, and you've got to play hard, and that still doesn't, you know, uh, you know, determine that you're going to win. But if you don't do those things, it's definitely going to determine that you're going to lose. So you've got a choice. You can go out and be ready to play, give it your best shot, take what happens, or if you're not ready, this Division I, you know, this stuff is too good, uh, and people will hammer you and pound on you. So, um, you know, a good week, two and two, from Monday to Monday, could have been better, though. We wish you well in this upcoming week, and uh, we will see you shortly down the road because I know we've got some scheduling conflicts coming up, but uh, good luck these next couple of ball games. Thanks, Mike. Doug Noll has been our guest, head men's basketball coach here at IPFW. We thank Doug, we thank uh, his son Brad Noll, Keon Henderson for joining us as well. And as always, we thank you, the viewer, for tuning in to Mastodon Spotlight to see what's going on with IPFW Athletics. Quick programming note, Friday and Saturday night, the biggest volleyball weekend of the season coming up. As on Friday night, our tribal ball state comes to town, and on Saturday night, it's perennial power Ohio State. If you can't make it out in person to the Gate Sports Center for the uh, 7 o'clock matches, tune in to College 56. Ryan Parrott and I will be happy to bring the action to you. But uh, again, a big, big weekend of volleyball here at the Hillier Gate Sports Center. That's it for this edition of the program. Again, thanks for tuning in. We invite you to come back next week as well. But until then, this is Mike Ma saying have a great week and go Dons.